Um, I'm going to be my pleasure to introduce Julie and Bruce. Um, they were here not too long ago, and um, I know that many people enjoyed having them and really learned a lot from them. Um, as I think back over, I did not realize it was 28 years, my goodness. I remember years ago when my grandson was about two, maybe, you were here, and we were out at Souls as a mission committee with the Adamsons, and you know, those of you that knew Dylan or know Dylan know that when he was two and three, he was like hyperactive. And um, I was talking with somebody, and it, it struck me, I wasn't hearing him, what was he into now? Now. And I looked over and Julie had him asleep on her lap. <laughs> and I thought, how did that happen? <laughs> it was wonderful, but it also showed me um, what a wonderful educator she is. And uh, the ability to calm children down is a, a gift. And so that was really, as she played her role in several of the places that they were in education, that was a really um, a, just a super gift from God. So, we, they are now back in the cities. They are working with Converge still, but with the International Ministries, um, working with the diaspora in the Twin Cities area and with the churches in the Twin Cities areas to awaken, um, to awaken the American church to the knowledge that we have people groups in the United States that have never heard the gospel. And so to that um, end, they've moved back here, and we're delighted that they're closer, and um, I'm just going to introduce them. Why don't you come on up? Am I on? Okay. I think we're going to show a little video. Yeah, we 28 years. That's amazing. And uh, I think for both of us, one of our recollections of, of um, Glory Baptist is the pianist. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you say so? Yeah. So um, anyway, it's a pleasure to be back with you. We're going to start with a, a little video. Um, as Ruth mentioned, it is amazing the, the numbers of, of um, immigrants that we have now living amongst us. Um, diaspora is another word that's used. The people that are migrating for various reasons, often not very um, good reasons, war, famine, persecution. And um, of course, most of you know that uh, here in Minnesota, we have the, the, the largest population of Somalis living outside of their, their homeland. So, um, and that's just one of the... Um, people groups, and they also are radically lost, um, very unreached, very few believers among, among this population. But we're just going to show a brief video. Pastor Stouter, wow. <laughs> so anyway, it's a blast from the past. Um, uh, and it, it'll just show you a little more uh, about the, the unique opportunities that we have here in the United States to reach um, unreached peoples. Although the greatest... physical and spiritual needs in the world still exist outside of North America, it might be surprising to learn that many of the least reached places and unreached people groups exist here within North America. It is estimated that 180 unreached people groups have migrated to Canada and 360 unreached people groups have migrated to the United States. This places the U.S. among the top three nations that contain the most unreached people groups. El Cajon, California is home to Little Baghdad with 60,000 Iraqis, and the Bay Area contains Little Kabul with tens of thousands of Afghans. Minneapolis, Seattle, and Columbus are home to well over 100,000 Somalis. Arabs, Sikhs, Kurds are living in places like Montreal, Nashville, and Toronto. <laughs> Bosnians and Arab Muslims have moved by the tens of thousands to places like St. Louis and Detroit. In North Carolina, Asian Indians make up 29% of all Asians in the state, amounting to nearly 70,000, with large communities of Gujarati, Tamil, Telugu, and Punjabi peoples living in the northern Charlotte and Morrisville Cary areas. More than 10,000 Hmong people from Southeast Asia now call Hickory home. Arabic is commonly spoken on the streets of Western Raleigh by nearly 10,000 Middle Eastern Muslims from Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and other countries. Something is wrong when we are willing to make great sacrifices to travel the world to reach a people group, but we're not willing to walk across the street. 
The Great Commission has no geographic boundaries. A key to reaching them over there is reaching them over here. A key to reaching them over here is reaching them over there. It's time to adopt a new model of missions that no longer divides between domestic and foreign because our Sovereign Lord has brought the nations to our cities, our towns, and our communities. As, um, as Ruth mentioned, uh, we are still with uh, International Ministries with Converge, um, but with a new initiative called the Diaspora Initiative. And the Twin Cities is actually the first of what we hope will be many diaspora initiatives around the United States. There's actually um, one, uh, uh, several of us visited Montreal, Canada um, last month, and that will probably become the, the second initiative. We'll, we just need to find a, an initiative leader, and, and that person will need to gather a team together. But um, uh, as you saw in the video, uh, incredible opportunities. A pastor, uh, I don't know if he's a pastor, um, who was here last week. Oh, Juan. Yeah, so he's actually engaged in the same ministry we are. We're, we're actually part of a, what they call a, a, di- a disciple-making movement practitioners network. And that's where we met, met him for the first time uh, several months ago. So um, we're really thankful for um, guys uh, like, like him. And, and there's a whole community actually in the Twin Cities that are uh, engaging in diaspora. So it's very exciting. Um, but you don't have to be in the Twin Cities. You can be in places like Pelican Rapids, Wilmer, um, uh, Owatonna, where there are large communities of, um, of least reached people. So this morning, we, Julie and I thought we would um, share about... Um, an idea called disciple making movements and um, Converge has a a new uh, I guess you'd call a a, a vision statement Um, we're asking God for um, uh, a gospel movement among every least reached people group in in our generation and that's just uh, brand new as of this year so fitting within that is this idea of, 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 of seeing a multiplication of disciples happening um uh, around the world and, and, and specifically right here in, in uh, the Twin Cities. What um, some of you might be familiar with, a magazine called Mission Frontiers. And there are, are people who are actually doing global mapping, um, looking at movements of the gospel among, among unreached peoples. Currently, there are, I think, 710 and counting movements of the gospel. That means there's four generations of churches. Um, and typically these are, these are simple churches, house churches. So d- disciple making is happening at such a rate that um, rapidly, uh, uh, rapid growth of the church from one to four generations and beyond that. And there are um, 710 movements. And this has all, largely all happened within the last, um, I would say, 15, 20 years. The, 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 the lion's share of those movements are happening in the last... Um, 10, 15 years. Just amazing movement of, of God's spirit around the world. And this is happening among um, typically resistant peoples. They're either Muslim or Buddhist, Hindu. Um, and so these movements are happening in places uh, um, what we consider the, consider the global south, what, we used to be, what used to be called the, um, the developing world. Uh, and now we use the term global south, global north. The global north is North America and Europe. Um, interestingly, there is only, I think, f- four movements in the global north. All the, these gospel movements are happening among uh, least reached people groups in the global south. So the question is, why isn't it happening yet among us? And um, those of us who are working in, in the Twin Cities are, are praying for God's Spirit to, to show up in a, in a big way and, and that we might see real um, multiplication of disciples happening, especially... Um, among the Somali community there. Um, so what Julie and I are going to share with, with you in the next 20 minutes, and we're going to have to go very quickly, but it's, it's seven um, practices to uh, promote a disciple-making movement. And we thought this would be... Uh, Ruth asked us to share just some of the things that we're, we're involved with and sort of our, um, sort of our, our MO for, for our work in, in the Twin Cities. So... Um, 
Julie begged me not to do this, and I, I don't think it will, but there's these seven practices, and I could, there are hand motions, actually, that I could show you, but I don't want to embarrass her, so I won't show you the hand motions. <laughs> but um, first is look, and you can probably uh, identify the hand motion for that. Uh, pray, engage, connect, gather, mentor, and multiply. Um, so, Julie's, she's not just eye candy up here. She's actually... <laughs> going to uh, read scripture for, for us. And there's, there's a, a scripture that will inform each one of these, these seven practices. Some of these practices will actually be divided up into um, uh, um, several. So um, you'll, hopefully you'll be able to follow as we go along. So um, let's see how this works. Is it on? Now it is. Okay. Okay. So, um, first, uh, we want to see the, the eyes, uh, see the world with eyes of faith. Um, see the world as Jesus sees the world. We're going to be reading quite a bit of scripture from the Gospels and Acts. So if you have your Bibles ready, you can uh, follow with me or just, just listen. So pertaining to this first one, Matthew 9, 35-38. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So uh, there's this idea that reaching the world with Jesus always begins with seeing the world as, as he sees it. So um, there, are, there are obvious places in the world where we see brokenness. Um, I, just on the drive up here, I was listening to Ron Hutchcraft with um, uh, uh, Wings of Eagle, Eagle Ministry. He has a ministry among uh, Native peoples. But he said uh, the suicide rate, the addiction rate among Native uh, First, First Nations peoples is four times the rate of general population. So there are obvious places where there's brokenness. And, and instead of being afraid of those places, Jesus is asking us to, to, to go right into those places. And, and obviously in the Twin Cities, you have the Phillips neighborhood, the most diverse um, sector uh, in the urban center, I think one of the most diverse in the United States, um, obvious places of, of need where, where they need the gospel. So um, we need to, to look at the world with, with, the eyes, um, with eyes of compassion. Uh, we also need to um, look in order to gather a team of disciple makers. Mark 1, verses 14 to 20. Mark 1. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Unfortunately, I think in the, in the West, um, in, the, in the church in the West, we've developed this idea that, that evangelism and discipleship, that that's the realm of the sort of the professional class of ministers uh, like Pastor Chris, um, and uh, they're, they're getting paid, actually, to make disciples and to evangelize. Um, but that was never uh, the, the, um, the idea in Jesus' mind, and certainly in, 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 in God's mind, that, that um, the discipleship and, and, and evangelism is, is reserved only for a select few. It's for God has called all of us to make that disciples. And, um, you know, I was just sharing in the Sunday school class that the, the term, um, the Great Commission... Uh, which we use in English and French, and we worked in a French-speaking context for many years, is the, the supreme order. And, and it's, um, that's, that's our responsibility. All of us need to be engaged in making disciples. So one of our, our roles uh, in this new initiative is to identify churches that want to uh, partner with us 
And we would help them um, discover a, what we would call diaspora champion within, within their church. And that person would be uh, given the responsibility to um, pray for a select number of individuals that um, just feel God calling them to a much more intentional um, uh, role in terms of making disciples. And they have the margin to do that. So um, disciple making is, and gathering a team of disciple makers is, is priority. Uh, okay, so uh, pray. Uh, this is the second uh, practice, and uh, center your life in prayer. Luke 10, verse 38 to 42. Luke 10. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her, to, tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. The, the reality is where we've been seeing these disciple-making movements happening around the world where the gospel is just flowing incredibly. We're seeing a multiplication of disciples. All, every one of those movements has happened because of extraordinary prayer. Um, people breaking out of their typical patterns of prayer. Well, I, in most of these cases, there hasn't been any pattern of prayer uh, other than a, a Muslim pattern of prayer, for example. But there's radical prayer taking place, um, prayer and fasting, all-night prayer, um, people really committing themselves to prayer. And so that's, that's what um, we, we will be encouraging our churches and people in our churches to, to um, break out of their normal practice of prayer and more in their normal habits and, and get involved in extraordinary um, acts of prayer. Um, another part of prayer is intercede together for your community. So not only is, is, um, are we asking people to um, uh, encourage them to deepen their own personal intimacy with the Lord, but obviously, um, collectively, we need to, to work together uh, in, in promoting prayer movements. Acts 4, 23-31. Acts 4. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said... Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed one. For truly, in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Um, so this whole idea of disciple-making movements, it's the, the idea is sort of going back to Jerusalem, where it all began um, in the book of Acts. And, and uh, we saw how the, the, the disciples really committed themselves to prayer um, and, and how God showed up in a, in, in a unique way. We know that was a part of his sovereign plan. But we're asking the church and, and its local... Um, uh, 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 local churches to to engage in extraordinary prayer, and that means um, maybe learning some new uh, activities of prayer. For example, prayer walking, identifying places where there's there is darkness, where there's a need for the gospel to be to be shared, and and walking around those those places and um, and uh, praying for for the people who live there. Um, so we've we've talked uh, um, about prayer and now uh, engaging. The, the community, and um, it means quite simply, first of all, to live out loud spiritually, and um, part of this is based on um, uh, the Shema, which is found in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses uh, 4 through 9, 
uh, where, where God says, Hear, O Israel. And word, the word Shema in Hebrew means to hear. But it's not just hear, it's actually to act on and to hear and obey. So um, it means uh, in that passage, it, th- those of you familiar, it, it talks about um, telling your children and wherever you, wherever you go, um, expressing your, your faith and, and, and the words of God um, uh, in con- concrete terms, uh, living out loud. And so we're, that's one of the things that Julie and I are learning. We're part of a, a missional group in, in the Twin Cities. And um, part of our, our, our homework is to actually, where, wherever we go, if we go to a, a shopping or a gas station or we happen to cross paths with our neighbor, we, we are praying for opportunities to, to speak a word that will reveal that we are people of faith. And um, it might, and beyond that, it might be um, uh, encountering somebody and just saying, is there something uh, um, about which you'd like me to pray? Um, in your, and so it's just living out loud. And I think that's, I don't think, I know that's how Jesus wants each of us to live. It's to live out loud. Mark 4, verse 21 to 22. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought, out, brought in to be put under a basket? Or under a bed, and not on a stand. For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Um, We're also called to engage, um, to compassionately serve um, the communities uh, that God is calling us to. And um, so it's one thing to to share in verbally our our love and compassion, but to actually be the hands and feet of Jesus is, is so important. Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. Luke 10. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will pay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And the lawyer said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. Um, finally, God is calling us to engage, um, engage these communities um, by by having an, a spirit of expectancy that God wants to move in powerful ways in those communities. And, um, uh, and so uh, sometimes we get the idea that, that uh, when, when Jesus um, ascended to heaven, that he took his power with him. But he didn't. He, he left his power with, with his disciples. And um, we are con- con- called to continue what, what Jesus start, started. Jesus is not... He, doesn't, he hasn't, hasn't turned down the power um, since his departure physically from the earth. But he's actually, if you um, follow the, his words in, in the New Testament, um, he's actually turned up the power. He's, he's actually given us the capacity to, um, to be not only his hands and feet, but to, um, uh, to be instruments of his power in people's lives. In the, these disciple-making movements, um, there are reports of amazing demonstrations, manifestation of, of God's power through healing, um, through um, demons being cast out, um, through uh, just a, a variety of ways. And, and that, there's no reason why that shouldn't happen here among us here in, um, in, in, the, in the Twin Cities. So we, we are asking 
folks who join us to be, become disciple makers that, that move out in expectancy that God is going to, to work through them in powerful ways. Reading from Luke 9, 1 and 2, and then John 14, 12 to 14. Luke 9 and John 14. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Okay. Um, uh, the fourth uh, practice is connect. And that's looking for, for people of peace. This morning in Sunday school, we, we uh, worked through Luke chapter 10, the first 12 verses. And it, it talks about Jesus sending out his, his 72 disciples. And he told them, wherever you go, uh, look for a, a worthy person, a man, a man of peace. Someone uh, in whose life God is already at work, who can be um, sort of a gatekeeper. Um, a term that is, is thrown a, a, around a lot in, um, in missions is oikos evangelism. Oikos is the term for household. And so there's this idea that um, if we want to see multiplication happen uh, in terms of disciple making, um, we don't just concentrate on the, the person in front of you, the individual, but we're, we're thinking, okay, um, how can, through reaching this person, can I, can I reach his household or her household? Um, so it, you're, always, you're constantly thinking group, um, network. And, and um, that's what's been happening around the world through these uh, disciple-making movements. We're seeing um, entire households being one for the Lord. Just basically, again, following the example of, of the disciples in the book of Acts. Reading from Matthew 10, starting at verse 7. And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. We also, um, and I, I basically mentioned this, we want to reach networks. So we want, as Jesus did, we want to pe meet people on their, on their own turf. And... Um, so the idea is, is not extracting them from their context and asking them to come and join Glory Baptist, but to go to where they are and, and to, to promote a, a movement of the gospel where they are and to see that flow through their own natural networks of relationships. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 to 17. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick do. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so the fifth uh, practice for um, promoting a disciple-making movement is the idea of gathering. Um, and uh, it means to teach immediate obedience. Um, in the, in the West, especially here in the United States, I think we have a very high value on knowledge, but we want to replace that value with obedience. Um, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, you will, um, uh, you will obey me. He didn't say you will learn as much as you can um, and just sit on it. He learned, he, um, if, you, if we want to be a true a disciple of Jesus, we need to obey. 
Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, another part of gathering is, obviously, it's not just about making disciples, it's, it's uh, seeing them assemble themselves into communities of believers. So, um, typically, so the goal of a disciple-making movement is not to, to grow an established church, but to make disciples that make disciples in order to penetrate the culture. So, um, the, the, uh, the big idea is transformation of, of the culture. And, um, uh, and I think we, we can think of examples in our own culture where the church is not fulfilling its role in terms of, of, of pushing back against um, what, what the culture is, is telling us. But we, um, in the Twin Cities, for example, where um, there's a large Somali community, um, there, there, are, there are parts of their, of their culture that um, uh, are acceptable, but then there are parts that obviously need to be rejected and changed by the gospel. So, so um, we, we want to see that transformation take place as, as, as disciples gather themselves in, into communities and they inform themselves by the scriptures, are taught by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Um, this follows when Peter had spoken to the Jews about Jesus whom they had rejected. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and, they were added, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, Attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The sixth uh, practice is mentoring. And um, following the example of, of Barnabas, for example, um, uh, Jesus obviously and, and his role in the lives of the disciples, um, but we see ourselves as, as catalysts. And um, those of us who, who are involved in, in, um, in making disciples, um, we, we don't want to come across as the experts. We, we did a, what we call a dis- discovery and inductive study together in, our, in, our, in Sunday school class this morning. And the idea is you, you want to create a, a level playing field where um, you heighten the role of God's Word and the role of the Holy Spirit in, in, in the lives of those that you are... Um, uh, you were studying the scriptures with. And so the idea is that um, uh, the discipleship doesn't happen in the church. That's a good thing. But you are actually, the, the church is, is, is being created through, through making disciples. So um, if we, we actually believe that discipleship happens before a person ever claims allegiance to Jesus. That, you, that um, in this, this whole idea of, of a disciple-making movement, that... Um, you just think of the disciples and how, how Jesus was discipling them before they ever, real, ever realized, wow, so this is the Messiah. Before they ever claimed that, um, made that claim, um, Jesus was discipling them into a, a proper understanding of what it means to, to um, uh, understand God's word and to obey it and apply it to their lives. So, so we, we want to um, create that same sort of... Um, a context for, for discipleship in, in our churches. Acts eleven twenty two, 
The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. And the last one is to multiply. And um, so we are, um, we are seeking to, to um, draw together individuals that, that um, want to listen to God, want to pray for vision, and will go where, where he is calling them. And um, it could be a multiplication of, 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 of leaders. Hopefully, we'll see a multiplication of, of disciples and, and churches. But um, uh, so we want to envision what, what God can do to, um, to multiply disciples, churches, and, and movements. Not, not only what we're already seeing in, in the global south around the world among, among resistant peoples, but right here um, beginning in the Twin Cities. Matthew thirteen thirty one and John twelve twenty four. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that all the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loses his life, whoever loves his life, loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Um, maybe I'll just close with um, just a couple of prayer requests. Uh, we're very thankful. I'll praise first that um, there's a, a couple, um, and I can't give you their, their names yet because they're, they haven't yet resigned from their current position, but they will be joining us full time um, as partners in, in the work in... in um, I, I keep saying the Twin Cities, but actually we're... Where um, our mandate is for the entire district, and um, that includes the uh, Iowa. So um, you know, they're in the Sioux City and in, in Des Moines. There are large concentrations of of uh, least reached peoples as well. So um, we want to make ourselves available to any community that is interested in and in forming a strategy. Um, and that the prayer request is is the formulation of this a city strategy or a, a strategy that is that is relevant for whatever context might be, um, that helps churches think strategically, missiologically, what is it going to take to see the gospel um, planted in that, in that community, whether it's a Cambodian or um, there's, a, you know, there's large Nepali, Bhutanese communities in the Twin Cities, uh, Tibetan. Um, it could be there's the largest Hindu temple um, in the Midwest is, is in Maple Grove. The largest Buddhist temple in the Midwest is in South, um, South Metro. I mean, it's cr- incredible. Um, the, the Twin Cities is actually, um, by many, many folks working in diaspora in the United States, they look at the Twin Cities as that place is, is a place where God is at work. Um, God's about to do something there. So we're really excited to be a part of, uh, of a group of people that are um, putting their heads together and thinking, um, you know, what is it going to take to see the gospel planted among these com- communities and, and spreading? So you can pray for that, for that implementation of the strategy in, in, through local churches. Um, it's, it's, it's very different where, where we worked in, the, in West Africa, where we were the minority among a Muslim community. Now we're the majority and you're working among, for example, Somalis, they are by nature very um, um, suspicious and very, historically very resistant to the gospel. Um, but, you know, we don't want to give up. We're not going to give up. We want, uh, we, we want to pray more. We want to uh, think together more um, as, as churches and as practitioners. But um, if you could just pray for, for wisdom and, and formulating the strategy and implementing that. And then... Um, 
Uh, pray f- actually tomorrow. I should mention tomorrow starts uh, is Ramadan, the, the holy month of Ramadan for Muslims around the world. There's amazing um, tools that we can use to pray for um, for Muslims, and I would encourage you. The one is called Prayercast. It's um, it's a, it's a video, and for the first time they have a video for every day of Ramadan, um, and it's a video of of, of, mu- of the Muslim world, and all parts of the Muslim world, where they highlight um, a specific people or um, could be a, a Muslim sect, um, whatever. But um, there's um, we 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 just would ask that you would uh, pray with us um, uh, for for these re- least reached peoples and for the strategy. So, thank you. As is our practice, we will uh, pray for you before we let you get out of here. And then a um, couple of points of things before I pray for them. If after the worship service you would like some prayer, we will have a prayer team here up front to come and pray with. Uh, if there's somebody up here with them, please allow them to pray. If you'd like to talk to the people praying, catch them in the lobby afterwards. You are invited. We are going over to the Pine Inn following uh, worship today. and We're going to have lunch with Bruce and Julie as we did with Waihan and his team last week. We had a very, very large group last week. We'd love to have that again this week. So if you are free and available, four miles straight east. When you hit the sign, take a right in about 200 feet. Take another right and you'll be in the Pine Inn. If you don't know how to get there, follow one of us. Um, It's pretty easy. But uh, you are invited to join us for lunch there today. And then the other thing I do want to mention is in the large refrigerator down in the uh, new kitchen is a bunch of milk. And that is for whoever would like some milk, take that milk and take it home. Uh, we don't want it to stay here. We don't want it to spoil. We want it to put it to good use. So if you would like some milk, take the milk with you, please. So with that, let us pray for Bruce and Julie and their ministry and their work, and uh, then let's get out of here. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Bruce and Julie and their willingness to serve and to heed your call and to spend a, a significant portion of their life in, in a faraway land. Uh, just serving and loving and giving. And Lord, uh, knowing that that was not the end of your call in their lives, they've returned and now are working here in Minnesota and Iowa and uh, Converge. And just pray, God, that as they work throughout uh, Converge North Central here, that your blessing would be upon them, your provision would be there for them, that you would make connections that they need to continue to reach out to these people groups that, God, you have brought to us. And Lord, we live in a time like never before where we have... An abundance of resources. We have all sorts of books. We have all sorts of videos. We have all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, Lord, none of that will matter if we don't simply go. And so, God, each and every one of us, you have called to go, therefore, and make disciples. Whether that's here in our backyards, whether that's in our county, whether that's in our state or in the world, Lord, you have called us to go no matter what. And so, God, may we heed that call. May we go boldly. May we take your love. May we take your joy and we go forth sharing your grace wherever you would send us. God be with the two of them as they continue to work. Your blessing upon them. It is in Jesus' high and holy and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. We are so blessed to have you with us today. Go and serve your King. Amen.